Great. Thank you very much. Well, welcome along, everyone. Um, good to see everybody awake and functioning. Uh, so the context of what Rob and I are going to talk about over the next uh, hour and a bit is that, as, as we all know, we've been driving the dairy industry towards selective dry cow therapy for very good reasons. You know, antimicrobial use in the dairy industry is under scrutiny locally and internationally. Uh, we know that... <coughs> Indications around mastitis are the major indication for antimicrobial use in the dairy industry. So by using selective dry cow therapy, we can reduce antimicrobial use on the average dairy farm by perhaps a third. And that's all well and good. But one of the issues, of course, is, well, OK, if we're going to go to selective, which cows do we choose? And you've all had the discussions with your herd owners. I don't herd test, I can't do it. Or I don't believe herd test data or whatever. Now. What we're going to talk about is some pretty cool technology that, and Rob will give you much better technical information than I can uh, about how it works, uh, but allows us to get effectively real-time somatic cell count or cell count equivalent data out of cows. And so the question really became, uh, you know, using this technology, can we choose thresholds or use this data to accurately predict which cows are likely to have infections are drying off and which ones don't. So effectively allowing us to choose the cows for selective dry cow therapy. So Rob's going to introduce the technology. I'm then going to talk about a field study we did using the technology and just showing you uh, that in fact the technology works really well. And for those farmers who've got this sort of technology in line, even if they don't herd test, they've actually got a really good basis or you've got a good basis to work with the farmers to, to select the right cows. So that's the, that's the roadmap. So I'm going to hand over to Rob and uh, join you again in a minute. Okay, so just to introduce myself, I guess um, I started with SenseTech 2002, so I've been working in this area of milk sensors for the past 20 years. Um, so I was closely involved <laughs> in the development of, our, of both of our commercially available um, our milk sensors. And I guess in the past decade or so, I've had a real interest in the, um, the use of the data from the sensors for on-farm management decisions, and, and I guess a little disappointed in the, in the lack of progress we've made in that, in that side of things. And the talk after this, when I'm, um, after Scott talks, I'm going to talk about um, more generally mastitis management as opposed to just the selective dry cow therapy and, and how we can do that better. Uh, but this is really exciting for me because it's a little step forward in terms of actually using the, the, the technology it's been around for a while now, um, actually using it for um, decisions on farm and with a really good scientific uh, basis. So just before I start, kind of set the scene a little bit. Um, this is, these two graphics are from Dairy NZ. Um, they, they conducted a technology survey every five years, so 2008, 2013, 2018. Um, and just surveying farmers for their, the technologies they're using on their farms. Um, the graphic on the left is talking about automation technologies and the one on the right is about animal data technologies. But I mean, generally the, 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 the theme of this is, is that rotary systems tend to have more technology and that technology use is increasing. And so there's this trend which is going to keep going which is increasing technology use on, on farms. And, um, farmers start using this technology to make decisions um, and I think it's really important that we have a, um, that they have a good uh, scientific basis from which to make those decisions and that the, that we have good <coughs> industry guidelines for um, for them to, to follow when using such technologies so that's why this this works really important and I think it's really um, really exciting so the sensors is my pointer so this is our milk sensor, it hasn't shown up very well on the, on the screen. Um, there's a better photo in the, um, in the booklet. And this is the ECC sensor, and the caption in the, the, caption in the booklet is back to front. Uh, the big one is the ECC sensor. So the milk's flowing, there's a laser gone. The milk's flowing through the milk tube, through the sensors. This sensor, the milk sensor is, the battery might be going. The milk sensor is using, um, analysing the milk as it flows past. The SCC sensor is taking a sample for analysis. The 
milk sensor used to be known as yield sense so that was how it was um, released initially uh, and it got rebranded as protrack protrack milk when we were with lic and uh, it's now got all flex uh, it's a multi-purpose sensor so it's measuring milk production attributes volume fat protein lactose so mastitis metrics uh, conductivity blood and milk abnormal milk uh, or watery milk it's got later on. Yeah. <coughs> uh, and some plant uh, diagnostics, blocked air admission hole, and, and some wash metrics. Um, so that's measuring many things. By contrast, too remote. By contrast, the ECC <laughs> device um, just has one thing, <laughs> visual somatic cell count. Uh, and that's the one that used to be known as CellSense. I see in the, in the um, program, it's listed as CellSense SEC study. So someone needs a slap on the on the wrist for that. It's ch changed. Um, and the market details. So the milk sensor was released in two thousand and six, and it's been sold into four countries. That's New Zealand, Australia, UK, and Ireland. Over ten thousand sensors sold into three hundred sheds. The SCC device was released around about the same time. Both of these technologies had a significant design change around 2010, make them much more reliable, uh, robust sensors on farm. The same countries, and we see less sensors but more sheds. Um, that's um, you know, driven by the fact we don't need to have SEC sensors on every bale um, to still be useful for, for monitoring that, the cows. And I also wanted to just highlight the Lely MQCC, so that's the Lely milking robots, they, they're coming out of the factory with an SCC device inside them, uh, and that uses the same core technology as our, as our sensor, we actually manufacture the, the analyzer for them. Uh, that's very successful as well, so they're, they're pumping those out, hundreds of them per month. Go get into a bit of the detail about how it works. So it's based on the rapid mastitis test gel reaction, or the California mastitis test. It uses one mil of milk, um, and another three mils for flushing, so that's less than a teaspoon overall. And the sample's taken 30 to 60 seconds into milking, which means we can get a result um, back within two minutes of the start of milking. About five mils of detergent is used, so it costs of about three cents per test. Uh, self-calibrating, self-cleaning during the system cleans during the system wash, um, and it's usually installed at 25% of milking points. So that'll give us, cows are milking twice a day, we'll get the result every second day for an average cow. And just drill in a little bit, a little bit more into the detail of the, of, the, of the test cycle. So this is a cross-sectional view of the analyzer itself. Um, and so this, this chamber here, so imagine the test from the previous cow has just been completed. This, this chamber here will have contamination, uh, some gel from the previous sample. Um, and so, and this tube, the milk tube here, will be full of milk from the previous cow as well. So the first thing we do is flush the milk out, so flush the previous cow's milk out, and then we fill with detergent through this port, and, and we run the shuttle. So this, this coil up here um, uh, generates a magnetic field. And in this little plastic thing we call a shuttle, there's a magnet, and so that gets lifted up, and then we release the core, the, the, the shuttle, and it falls back down, and we can use the same coil to measure the full time. Um, initially, we're just cleaning, so we're using the detergent to, to clean out the cell and, um, and flush it away. So after that point, we've got a nice clean analyzer, and we've got the milk, this, the milk in this tube is now the milk of the new cow. Uh, so we fill it up to the halfway point with milk, add the detergent to the top, and then we run the shuttle 16 times. So that's both mixing and, and measuring the viscosity as it does that. And then we've got uh, some equations that convert that into an estimate of somatic cell count. And in terms of accuracy, uh, <coughs> this is data. So I've got all flex SCC on the, on the y-axis and lab so flow cytometry on the on the x-axis. Um, so it looks pretty good. Um, 40,000 cells per mil 
below 200k and 31% above above 200k. And that's with a cow side test, so that's where we take a sample from the cow, present it to the sensor who's just sitting on the table near the cow, uh, and then we send the exact same sample to the lab for analysis. When we move to an online test where we're taking, um, you know, running the sensor in, a, in its normal operating mode, uh, testing in real time, and then we compare that with a herd test, we get something like this. Okay, so it's a lot more noisier. Can anyone have a guess as to why it's a lot noisier? No? Okay, so there's a number of things that are different on, on the real the real operation, the real time operation. Um, you've got things like temperature, it could be milk contam contaminants, but the main thing is that we're taking a, a one mil sample quite early in the milking, and we're trying to compare that to a representative proportional sample from the herd test. So you wouldn't necessarily expect those two things to agree. We, d we do see a change in somatic cell count um, during the milkings, especially for you know, cows with elevated somatic cell count. Uh, but if we um, are interested in a, a short-term average of a cow, uh, which is something for a, many decisions that farmers want to make, you're actually interested in the, the typical ECC over the last week or 10 days. Um, when we do that, so, so now we're comparing the 10-day sensor average against the 10-day herd test average. So for this, we, we tested, herd tested for 10 consecutive days. Um, and we get a much better um, relationship. In fact, the, for the high end, our standard deviation of relative error is, is only 20%, which is better than it was on an individual test level on a cow side test. Um, and I've actually uh, presented uh, this, this study at, at ICAR and, and compared it against <coughs> how, how good would a single herd test in the middle of that 10 days estimate the um, 10 day average, because of course that's suffering from a disadvantage as well, because it's only got that one measurement and we know cell count varies um, significantly from day to day. And it showed that the sensor was actually doing a better job estimating the 10 day um, average. Okay, just I'm going to go through a series of these plots now because I think they're really cool and good to look at. Um, so this is a data for one cow for, for a lactation. The, the grey data points are AM or midday volumes, and the black ones are PM volumes, and the green is conductivity, so that's our milk sensor data. And then the blue ones are the sensor somatic cell count, and the yellow is the herd tests. So we were herd testing monthly, and we were doing separate sample lab analysis as well, so we were, we were getting two SCC results for that herd test. Uh, so for this cow, you can see it's pretty clear, the cow's healthy, and then she becomes sick. And she stays sick for the whole lactation. Oh, the other thing is we've got the, uh, the sample we took at dry off um, and showing she's got a major pathogen. And here's an example of a healthy cow. Don't need to spend too much time on that one. Um, here's a cow that appeared to have a, a mastitis episode uh, and then um, <coughs> looks like she's recovered completely. She's got low cell counts for the remainder of the lactation and she's got a negative back dough. And this cow's obviously got a chronic problem right through the whole lactation, major pathogen. Um, one of the things that I take out of this gives me really com real confidence that the sensor is telling us something useful because it's it's showing us, um, it's always kind of consistent with what the herd test is saying, but it's giving us a much more granular picture, um, especially you know, if, if you didn't have monthly herd testing there, you had four herd tests or even one herd test, and this is giving you a much more granular picture of what's happening with that cow for the whole lactation. Um, this one is a little, little bit different. It's showing something happened around here. It appeared like it based on the cell count data, it may have recovered, um, and then there's an increase at the end. So whether it's had some kind of latent infection which is hidden and then re-emerged at the end, or whether it's a separate um, infection, uh, but it's got a minor pathogen at the end. 
this is kind of similar, but um, we see cell count, the sensor cell count at least saying it's not really back to what it was, um, and then at the end it flares up again, and the HER test came, came down quite low, but then pretty good, pretty good agreement between the sensors, he's probably saying there's something happening in the udder at that point, but we got back to a negative. Uh, so this is the kind of one that makes me wonder about the, the back toe. <coughs> uh, and then there's a few like this which are a little bit more ambiguous. Um, where you've got the cell count is up but it's not really that high. It's around that sort of threshold level that you think about treating um, the dry off. This has got a minor pathogen. Um, so there's quite a few that end up like this in the ambiguous level. And this one looks like the sensor is, the, the HER test is higher than the, the sensor throughout, um, except at the end when the sensor starts to come back up, and it has a minor pathogen. Um, see the blood, blood and milk alerts over here. And the last one, again, well, this is kind of the opposite, the, the HER tests are really low, but the sensor's a little bit up. And this is, even though the cell counts aren't extreme, major pathogen. So. Um, this is also, I, d I didn't notice this until yesterday when I was just going through the slides again. Um, but we've got these, these blood, this, this is the, the upper limit of, we can, of what we can test. So it's above this, 2,000 milligrams per litre haemoglobin. So the blood here. Um, and so what's happened here is I don't think it's I don't think it's mastitis because the cell counts have all stayed low, um, but the cow's gone once a day. This is these are grey. I'm not sure if you can see that properly. These are grey data points. There's no corresponding afternoon milkings. Um, so I think it's probably like over engorgement of the of the udder, which has caused some leakage of blood into the milk. Um, yep, and that's me. So. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, if I can go double-handed, that's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Um, so Rob set it up really nicely and explained the technology. So I came at it from a really practical point of view of saying, well, okay, we've got the potential of getting a lot of data out of these cows, um, you know, multiple data points. So the question is, well, which data points do we use? How does that correlate with... Um, herd test data because I guess that's what most of us use most of the time to select cows but ultimately the gold standard in inverted commas is microbiology so the way we set the study up was to actually ask the question and, and, and how does the cell sense data work and which of the metrics how do we use that cell sense data to predict what infection status might be and how does that then correlate with with herd test data which you know we're, we're all all very familiar with Oh, sorry, what I should do is just uh, acknowledge that, you know, we, we ran the study, but I certainly want to acknowledge, you know, Rob's technical input in terms of getting the data and Amanda and Joe's help with actually setting it up. It was a dream study from my point of view because the herds were enrolled, all of that stuff was done and I had the fun of playing with the data. So it's, uh, it went really well and it was, a, it was a great study from that point of view. Cool. Um, so just... Sorry about this, but Epidemiology 101, we need to just make sure we're all on the same page here when we're talking about sensitivity and specificity. So what we're assuming for this study is that milk culture is the gold standard. Now, we can have the discussion about whether uh, milk culture is perfect, and it certainly is not. It itself does not have 100% sensitivity and specificity. But from a practical point of view, my belief is what we're trying to do is find cows that we believe on balance are truly infected, therefore we can justify using antimicrobials. So, for example, a high cell count cow that is culture negative is not normal, but she's not necessarily carrying a bacterial infection today, therefore I can't justify using antimicrobials. Does that make sense? So the gold standard we've used here rightly or wrongly, is did we grow bugs out of that cow? Yes or no? That's what we're trying to optimise our test, to try and compare our tests against. So, of course, no tests are perfect. So we've got our gold standard, and as I'll show you later, we've declared a cow positive 
if she grew bacteria in one or more quarters and we went on and actually split it into cows that had minor pathogen infection, so a CNS or a Carini, uh, or they had a major pathogen, which may have also had other bugs there as well. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So our, our, our true positive for the sake of this study is, did we grow bugs? Yes or no? Uh, a negative, obviously, is the converse. We didn't grow bugs. Uh, and then we've, we've got a test. Now, the test might be a herd test result of over 150,000 we declare as positive uh, or you know, less than 150,000 we declare negative. Or as I'll show you in, in a minute with the, with the Orflex sensors, we'll put a cut point in there and do the same thing. So we've got the test result here, so the, the positive. But of course, we don't get total agreement. And I'll show you the raw, some raw numbers in a minute. But you know, ideally, all of the gold standard positives would be test positive and all of the gold standard negatives would be test negative. But in reality, as we know, tests aren't perfect. We will get some false negatives. So there'll be cows that are infected for whatever reason, don't trip the threshold for somatic cell count or the Orflex. And conversely, there'll be animals that do trip the test that have a cell count over 150 that we don't grow bugs out of. So, you know, for, for what I'm saying, we're going to call those false positives. So we now define our sensitivity is, you know, your true positives over all of the uh, yeah, so the test positives over the all of the, the positives, the specificities in the, the, this group here, the true negatives over all of the negatives, the positive predictive value is amongst the animals that are test positive, how many of them are, are truly infected in this case. So it's true positives over all of the test positives. Flipping that around, your negative predictive value, if the test says they're negative, how many or what proportion of those are truly negative? So true negatives over the sum of the negatives, and then our definition of accuracy, and the people use different definitions, but the way the one we've used here is the, the total number of animals that were true positive plus true negative divided by all of the animals we tested. So how many did we categorize the right way, basically? And we can calculate these and we put confidence intervals and we can do smart stats around them, which I'll, I'll show you some of that in a minute. Cool. Now, that's all very well. When in, in the previous slide, I've said here that we've, we've got a positive test or a negative test. But of course, when we get herd test data or the Orflex the cell sense data, of course, it's a continuous variable. It goes between you know, zero and 30 million or whatever the number is. We have to make a decision. Somewhere we'd have to draw a line in the sand and say, well, above that not line, we're going to declare them test positive. We think they're likely to be infected. Below the line, we're going to declare them test negative and we'll assume they're not infected and we'll treat them with teeth seal or whatever it is. Um, and the important point here is that that cut point is always a compromise. We never get a perfect test. We are always trading off sensitivity for specificity. So if we want to increase our sensitivity, we want to find more of the infected cows, our specificity is going to go down. We get more false positives, right? And I'll show you some numbers to, to, to get your head around what that, what that actually means practically. But it is true, it is always true that you're going to have a, have a compromise. There is no perfect cut point, there is no right answer, there's always a, a, a compromise in there. Now just to show you, and this is, this is real world data, it's not actually out of this study, it's out of, a, out of another study we did but with a similar design. So in this case we've just got number of cows up the y-axis, we've got the natural log of the maximum herd test somatic cell count. It's the natural log of the maximum herd test somatic cell count from the whole of the lactation. And you might say, why have you used that number? Um, I've logged it because if you don't put it on a log scale, it ends up way over here and you get a really weird looking distribution. The second thing is that the SAM plan actually focuses on using any of the herd test data. It doesn't use the last herd test data. It actually says, look at all of your herd test data. And that's effectively what this means. It says, what is the highest cell count at any of the herd tests? Is it above the threshold or below the threshold? In this case, I put a black line here, um, is actually at the equivalent of 200,000 cells. And I've used that because that's kind of the international standard. 150s, obviously, in here somewhere or other. So the, the animals that were truly not infected, or sorry, were culture negative, are uh, here in the, in the blue bars and the animals that we grew a major pathogen from in one or more quarters are in the, in the red bars here. So the first thing to notice is there are a lot more non-infected animals than infected animals. So the population of infected animals is, is much smaller numerically than, than the not infected. The other thing that is, is pretty obvious is that there are 
inverted commas, false positive. So some of the unin apparently uninfected animals here are above our threshold. So they've got, you know, cell counts of, you know, up to the millions, but we didn't grow a bug out of them. And that's, you know, they could have self-cured, they could have been anaerobes, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why that might have been. But we've also got um, false negatives. There are some of our major pathogen infected cows here that did not have a cell count that was over 200,000 at any stage of the lactation, right? So for whatever reason, they never had a spike in cell count. Now, for this particular study, this is kind of conventional New Zealand herd testing where they were doing three or four herd tests a year. So we can have the discussion about maybe they didn't do enough herd tests or they were at the wrong time or whatever. But the point is, there are some animals that never trip the cell count. And if we were using teat seal alone in the low cell count cows, some of these cows that truly had a major pathogens, had a staphylococcus strep, would have been treated with a teat seal alone. That's because that's where we drew the line, right? And, you know, I can shift this line and you can do it yourself visually. You can shift this line, you know, you could go 50,000 that way or 50,000 that way. It doesn't matter where you shift that cut point through. You're always going to have some false positive, false negatives and false positives, right? There is no perfect answer. We're always compromising. It's always a trade-off. Cool. So one way to try and firstly see whether a test is better than guessing, because we could go and spend money and do a test, and actually it's no better than flipping a coin. It may be no better than guessing. So the first question is, is doing a test on that cow, whether it be herd tests or the Orflex or any other test we want to do, better than just walking up to the cow and randomly giving her a dry cow or a toot seal, for example? So that's the first question we want to ask. The second question we want to ask is with a continuous variable, where do we draw that cut point? Where do we try and draw a cut point that gives us the best outcome with the data we've got? And one way to try and answer those two questions is to use what's called receiver operator curve. And what these do is basically in one diagram cut, uh, test or give you data on every possible cut point, right? So if we've got a cell count range between you know, 10 to 10 million, you could theoretically draw a cut point at 10, 20, 30, 40 and slice the data in multiple different places. And that's effectively what the receiver operator curve is doing, right? So just walking you through that. So a sensitivity of one means that every infected cow is detected wherever we put that cut point. So to use a ridiculous example, let's set the cut point of our herd test at 10 cells per mil, right? In that case, our sensitivity is 100% because every infected cow has a cell count above that. Right? We've got every infected cow. But of course, we've got all the uninfected cows as well, haven't we? We've picked up all of the rest of the population because all cows are going to have a cell count above 10, mostly. And so, yes, our sensitivity is 100%, so that's great. We've got really good sensitivity. But reading down on the x-axis, our one minus specificity, and it's, it's us about, you've got to think of it, is one, which effectively means one minus one is zero. So we've got a 0% specificity. So great sensitivity, but rubbish specificity. So we say, okay, we don't, we don't like a sensitivity 100%. Let's compromise. Let's come out here. And, you know, arbitrarily, let's, let's choose 150,000. I've made these numbers up. They're not real. But let's, let's go down to 150,000. So we've, we've moved our cut point down. Our sensitivity has dropped because there are some truly infected animals that by chance alone have a cell count less than 150. So our sensitivity must go down. Our specificity has got better. Um, and in fact, you know, arbitrary at this cut point, 97% sensitivity, specificity is 54. So, you know, good sensitivity, but our specificity is not good. We're still treating with antibiotics a lot of cows that are truly not infected. So we might say, oh, well, we want to um, do a bit of a trade-off. We're going to drop our sensitivity. So we're going to walk our way up to the curve here to, you know, 85% specificity, uh, sensitivity, sorry. But our specificity is now better. It's now 60 so again, just showing you as we move our cut point up, we're trading off. As, as we go further down the curve, we're dropping our sensitivity, but increasing our specificity. So one of the question is, well, what are we trying to achieve here? Are we trying to find every infected cow, which means every cow gets dry cow effectively, or are we gonna say, we're gonna accept a, you know, a sensitivity of 97%, specificity's not brilliant, so we're gonna over treat some can animals, but we'll, we'll drop some of the uninfected animals, we'll drop below the threshold and we'll give them teat seal alone. Um, so, you know, that's what these curves do. Now, in an ideal world, this curve would go right up into this top left-hand corner. We'd have a, you know, 100% sensitivity or one sensitivity and a 
one minus specificity of zero. But of course, that's not the case. So one of the ways of optimizing this test is to say, well, which data point here is closest to the optimal, closest to this top point? So there's a thing called the Uden index, and I think I'll refer to it later, where you literally just add the sensitivity and specificity together and say, what is the, the cut point which maximizes the, the sum of the sensitivity and specificity? So that's one way of choosing a cut point. You just say, I want a test that is most accurate, that classifies animals correctly most of the time, or the maximum number of times. The trade-off is, well, the point then is that, in fact, optimizing, increasing sensitivity may be more important than increasing specificity. The reason is I want to find those major pathogen infections because I want to treat them. So I'm always going to say, or I'm going to tend to say with a test like this, let's err on the side of increasing sensitivity. Let's see if we can get most of the major pathogens. Um, and, but the trade-off is our specificity goes down, so we're going to have more false positives. We're going to treat more cows as we drop the cut point down. Does that make sense? You've all dealt with this. You've all grappled with this. But yeah, that's what receiver operator curves do. Now, statistically, we can do smart things like calculate the area under the curve, and we can test the area under the curve of multiple tests at the same time. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. And we can formally statistically say, is this test better than that test at a global level, at an area under the curve level? And again, I'll, I'll show you some of those data in a, in a minute. Cool. So let's get back to practicalities. How did we actually go about uh, working out whether the Allflex works or not. And the way we did it was that there were four herds enrolled around the country, and I'll show you a bit more data on those in a minute. About 1,500 cows were actually sampled on these herds. Uh, by design, these herds were actually on monthly herd testing, not second monthly, so they're, they're a little bit unusual from a Kiwi point of view. And just to be clear about it, the last herd, uh, herd test relative to drying off was a median of 10 days. So we were, the her, last herd test was pretty close to drying off because, you know, as, as some of you have discussed, I'm sure with your clients, there's this thing about, well, if the last herd test was 60 days or 80 days or 100 days off pre-drying off, does that mean herd test is not such a predictive test because we've had this time in which an animal could be infected, therefore our tests are not working that well. So, you know, by design, the last herd test was pretty close to, uh, to, to drying off. And as I say, it's a median of, of uh, 10 days and the interquartile range is 7 to 21 days. So, you know, half the cows were herd tested one to three weeks before drying off. The, the, the meters were in place um, and turned on uh, for the last 12 weeks or so of, of the lactation. Um, and as I'll show you in a minute, the, and Rob mentioned before, that not every bale had a, a meter in it, right? So, the, the, and, and I'll show you that data in a minute. What we then did was um, the tech teams went out and they took cow composite samples from, from all the animals presented to us at the last, at or just before or just after the last milking. And so, you know, tea dens were cleaned as per normal, and then we just took a mill of milk out of each quarter into one vial, and the one vial went into the lab. And the reason we did that was we were interested in whether the cow was infected. We weren't interested in which particular quarter was, was infected. We just wanted to say, this cow's infected or not infected, and we would or would not treat it with dry cow. You know, that, that, was, the, that was the logic for using composites. Uh, so, you know, standard conventional microbiology. The one thing we did do was instead of plating 10 microliters, which is, you know, standard lab technique, we went up to 50 microliters. And the reason for that is that you get a dilution effect. So if you've got one infected quarter, and three uninfected quarters, of course, you're getting a dilution in terms of the number of colony forming units there. So we went to 50 on a whole plate just to you know, bring our sensitivity up almost equivalent to what it would be for an individual quarter level sample. Uh, and that's the logic there. And then once we had the micro results, each animal was then defined as either no growth you know, on that plate. So the assumption was none of the quarters were infected, minor only so that the only growth that was on the plate was a carina or a CNS and, and, and a few other odds and sods. And then the third category was, was there a major pathogen there? So was there a Staph aureus, Strep uvis, Strep dyscalathia, basically. Uh, there were two E. coli, which I ignored and called minor. It wasn't, wasn't really a big issue. Uh, so they've been put to one, one side. Uh, and then within this population of 1,500 cows, I had the micro data, Rob didn't. Uh, and what we did was within each herd, uh, we randomly assigned the cows to either be the, 
the, the so-called training group of cows, roughly 740 odd of those, and then the test group, which was the, the other half of the cows. And what I did was I actually emailed Rob and said, here's the infection status of this subset of cows. You go away and do some smart maths on the Orflex data and come back and tell me what the infection status of the test group. So Rob was completely blinded to the infection status of the test group. I knew, he didn't. And so what Rob did was to take all of the Orflex data, and he's shown you some really nice graphs of all of that. And of course, there's lots of different ways you could slice and dice that data. So do you take just the readings from the last week, or the last two weeks, or the last four weeks. So he did a whole bunch of stuff there, so one, two, four, eight weeks of duration. And then of course there's lots of metrics you could calculate. You could take the mean of all of those data points. You could take the geometric mean, so you could log transform it. You could take the maximum, you could take the minimum, 75th percentile, and so on. So the whole bunch of optimizing of the, of the actual number of the algorithm that Rob then used to predict the infection status to pass back, back to me. The other thing that Rob did was to model the bale coverage. So Rob mentioned that the standard install is that one in four bales in, in your dairy sheds got one of these units in. So by chance alone, if you're on twice a day milking, you know, a cow will get a data point every second day. Um, but in fact, just uh, some of these sheds actually had higher bale coverage. And so there was more data there than the commercial farmer might have or average farmer might have. So Rob was able to then remodel and deliberately drop out some of the sensors and say, well, actually, if we only had 10% of bale coverage, so only one in 10 bales there, what would these metrics look like? How predictive would the model be? Because we've got a lot fewer data points for each cow over each time period, right? So lots of different numbers. Now, when Rob did all that, what he came back with and said, the best measure, or the most predictive measure, was the 12-week uh, bounded geometric mean. So what's that mean? What that means is that at very low cell count, it, it's not quite so accurate. So Rob said, well, if it was less than 50,000, we'll call it 50,000. Took all the data points, logged them, and then took the mean of that. And that's the number that, that he then used to predict whether they're infected or not, and passed the status back to me. Does that make sense? So the, the effectively, the, the, the average of the log of the cell, of the Orflex data for the last 12 weeks was the most accurate way of predicting infection status. And that's what we're, what we're going to use from now on, now on in. And so once Robert done all his smart maths, come back to me and said, I think this cow's infected, this cow's not, I then able, was unblinding it and went back and said, well, actually the result was this. And that then allows me to have my gold standard, my true test result versus, you know, what the Orflex was predicting was infected or not infected. Um, as I said before, micro's the gold standard. We then you know, did the sensitivity specificity, all the obvious stuff, did the areas under the curve, and, and uh, looked at some cut points. Right, so just a bit of information. Four herds all around the country, a couple in the Waikato, one in the Naki, one in Southland, 280-odd to 1,000-odd cows, crossbreddy herds. Uh, dry cow therapy, I mean, that's beyond the scope of this study, but you know, one did blanket, three did selective. Some of them used teat seal, some of them didn't. Um, the bale coverage here, so 40% of bales in this 50 bale rotary, 50%, uh, so half of them in this one, and, and so on. The herds varied in terms of their milk quality. So one of the herds, the Southland herd, actually had an average cell count for the whole of the lactation of 51,000. So it was a very, very clean herd. Um, up to uh, the Waikato herd was averaging 240,000. And in terms of percentage of pickups over 200, you know, the clean herd only 10% of pickups were over 200K at the bulk tank level. Uh, but, you know, the Taranaki herd, for example, 57% of the pickups were over 200 there, just to give you a feel for it. Uh, milk yield, uh, you know, kind of average to low uh, Kiwi herds. So the, the Southland herd was a very low input grass-based system. The other three, you know, had some level three dairy and Z herds. Uh, so, you know, total lactation production not, not particularly high. And the clinical mastitis incidence uh, on the records went from, you know, 5% in the second Waikato herd up to 17%. So again, sort of broadly Kiwi average sort of herds. Cool. Bulk milk somatic cell count, just because I could draw a pretty graph, I did. Um, so just each, each pickup represented here. Uh, and you can see, yeah, you know, the four herds are quite different. The Southland herd is, is very low, but did pick up towards, towards the end of lactation. In terms of clinicals, this is just calendar month, um, cow, percentage of cows that were diagnosed with clinical. Uh, herd one, the white cattle herd, had a bit of a spike in, in 
uh, very early lactation then settle down. But all of the herds had some clinicals pretty much through lactation. Yeah, again, pretty, pretty standard sort of Kiwi thing. In terms of the bugs, so this is uh, the percentage of cows up the y-axis, the bug on the x-axis, and coded by the four herds. So herd one, it's one, the big Waikato herd, herd two is the small Waikato herd, the open bar three is Taranaki, and four is the Southland herd. A um, couple of pretty clear messages here. The, the Waikato number one herd here, the no growth rate was only 23%, something like that. So nearly three quarters of the cows in that herd had, were, were infected, either were, and, and predominantly with a minor infection, a very high infection rate. The uh, Taranak in Southland herd, about 50% no growth rate. So roughly half the cows were infected, half the cows weren't at drying off. When we look at the bugs in a bit more detail, herd one had a whole bunch of carinies floating around, the other herds not so much. The other herds predominantly CNS. And, and the most common bug was a group of bugs with a minor. So about half the cows were infected with a minor. All herds had aureus and hubris, okay? Every one of these herds had, had at least some cows with aureus and hubris in there. Mixed major means that they grew two bugs. So they might have had a staph aureus and a CNS or a, uh, sorry, mixed major had a staph aureus and a strep hubris. Uh, mixed minor means they had a CNS and a coriony, something like that, okay? That's what, that's what that means. To, and just to summarise that, just to make it a bit easier, so four herds here, percentage of cows, no growth in the green, minor in the, in the orangey yellow, and the majors in the red. So you know, clearly there's some differences there between the herds, but all herds had major, major pathogens, as you'd expect. Right, um, in terms of the number of data points we had to work with, so I said you know, we ended up using this 12-week, uh, but... By chance alone, some herds may have, some cows may have stood in a bale. There was a sensor at one milking and not at the next. So the median we had about 18 data points per cow is the median. But you know, some some cows just by chance alone had relatively few data points. Some actually had up nearly 60 over that 84 day window. It's just just this is just chance. It's just, it's just probability game. But the point is, it does vary. But in you know, the median was about, as I say, about 18, 18 data points. Okay, so this is now the actual all flex data. So this is the, again, the natural log of the geometric mean of the 12 week all flex somatic cell count. Um, and this is just number of cows up the y axis. So the no growths in the top panel, the minor pathogens in the middle panel, and the majors in the bottom panel. And as I showed you on the previous slide, uh, you know, wherever we draw the cut point, we're going to have some false positives and false negatives. So with the, uh, with the no growths there, oh sorry, the, that, the red line's now at 150. Um, we've got some false positives, so there were some no growths here that, that had high geometric mean, uh, all flex number. Uh, there were some animals that were definitely false negatives. So there were some truly major pathogen infected cows that had very, very low average uh, cell count over that 12 week period. Now, the reason I've split the minors out is just to show you how variable minor pathogen infections are in terms of cell count. And, and it's true whether you use herd test data or use the Orflex data. The, 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 the Carini and CNS cows are all over the shop. The majority actually do have a low cell count, but there are some here that actually have very high cell count up, up into the Millionaires Club. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, there's 50 or more CNS species, they are not all created equal, for example. Some CNS probably drive a much greater inflammatory response than others, uh, and so there's some bug differences, there may be cow differences, there may be timing uh, issues of when those infections occur and whether they self-cured. But the point is, wherever I draw the line, I'm gonna have problems with the miners. I can't classify them cleanly because they have such a wide distri distribution. Cool. So this is now the receiver operator curve for the all-flex data for the major pathogens. So a couple of things we can say here is that the area under the curve is 0.82. So one is a perfect test. Zero, uh, sorry, 0.5, which is this dash line, is the guess line. So knowing, doing the all-flex test, and it doesn't matter which cut point we use, we'll talk about that in a minute, doing the test is better than guessing. Statistically, we're better off knowing that data and trying to predict the cow status than flicking a coin cow by cow, right? So the test tells us something. The next question is, well, okay, where do we start putting the cut point? And what I've done here, and, and I've just arbitrarily chosen these points again, if I said, right, 
I want a sensitivity of 90%. I want to get nine out of 10 of the major pathogen infected cows. I need to set my cut point at about 143,000 on the, on the 12 week mean somatic cell count. At that point, the specificity is 47%. Okay, that, that's, that's what this graph is telling me. I might say, oh, you know, I don't, I, I don't want a specificity that low, I want to increase specificity. So what I've done in the orange dot is said, actually I want a specificity of 70%. I want to get less than, or well, 30% or less of false positives. I want to reduce the number of false positives. So I move my cut point, in this case, up to 222,000. But as I was saying before, my, my trade-off is my sensitivity has now dropped to 81%. I am now missing one out of five of those major pathogen infections by moving my cut point to, to 222,000, but my specificity is better. I've got fewer false positives. And as I was saying before, it's always a trade-off. It doesn't matter where I put my cut point, I'm gonna to have to do a trade-off here. But that's, and that's the data. Cool. And just to, to illustrate that cut point, if I set my cut point to 125,000 on this data set, my sensitivity is what, about 96, 97%, but my specificity is down at 37, 38%. If I move my cut point to 150,000, my sensitivity comes down to you know, 88 or whatever it is, my specificity goes up to 50 and so on. You know, I can just move my cut point up, my sensitivity goes down, my specificity goes up. No right answer, no perfect point, but that's what happens when you move your, move your cut points. Cool. Now, let's ask the question, uh, how does the AllFlex data compared to having herd test data. So these are three separate receiver operator curves from the data is in red is, so the curve here is the AllFlex data, which I've already shown you, but I've now changed it to be red. The la, if I just used the most recent herd test data point I had for the animal and then used my cut point off that or draw, drew my receiver operator curve off that, that's the blue line. If I use the maximum herd test somatic cell count for any of the lactation, and remembering that we've got seven or eight herd test data points from each of these cows uh, because they're on monthly, that's the yellow line. There's our guess line again. And the take home message out of this is that there is actually no difference in the area and the curve. So even though you know, there's a bit of noise, there's a bit of variance there, statistically there is no difference in the ability of the Orflex somatic cell count to differentiate an infected from a non-infected cow, or in this case, a major pathogen infected, compared to using just the last herd test data, if that's the only data point we've got, or the maximum of the herd test uh, data for, for the whole season. So, you know, statistically, there is no difference in, in using, using those three tests. They'll give us roughly the same answer. Not saying the cut point's the same, what I'm saying is, the area under the curve, the ability of the test to differentiate infected, not infected is, is, is equivalent. And these are the area under the curve data. So 0 0.82, 0.82, 0 0.84. Again, no difference there. Uh, performing pretty, pretty much the same way. What about any infection? So sorry, I, what I should have emphasized is in this, so the major pathogen was test positive. If they were a minor pathogen, I put them in the no growth, no growth group. Okay, so all I'm doing is splitting them into, could we find a major pathogen? Everything else goes into the negative group. But what about if we said, actually we want to detect any infection. So we've got the no growth group is our negative group and our positive, we're optimizing against any infection, whether that be a major or minor, right? Now, one thing you'll notice, and, and again, same color coding there, the area under the curve is actually slightly less. So the, the ability of any of these tests to differentiate any infection cow from non-infected cow is not as good as predicting whether there's a major pathogen versus everything else, the minors and the no growth. And, and that's because, remember back to those uh, minor pathogens, their cell count was all over the shop. Wherever I draw the line, I can't differentiate the miners very, very well. So that's why the area under the curve is a little, little lower here. Uh, and so, yeah, numerically, you know, remember it was about 0 0.82, we're now down to 0 0.78. Interestingly enough, the Allflex has actually got a greater, higher, larger area under the curve than the other two. So statistically, um, I'll just back up, the Allflex actually is doing a better job of differentiating any infection from non-infection at a cow level than, than using the herd test data. But I would make the point that it's mainly at this quite low sensitivity when our thresholds get quite high. So biologically, it probably doesn't mean that much. 
Cool. Okay, but let's go back to the cut point. Where, where do we draw the line? So we've got, you know, we've got a nice new toy. We, we can use this data. Where do we draw the line? So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. What about if we said we want to get 90% sensitivity? We want to get 9 out of 10 major pathogen infections. Where do we draw our cut point? With the all-flex, it was 143, and I've already shown you that data. Maximum her test somatic cell count, interestingly enough, was higher. It was about 270,000 to get 90%. So if you drop your maximum down to, say, 150, your sensitivity is actually very high. Um, and the last her test, numerically, was actually 143, and that's not a typo. That's actually true. Um, slight differences in sensitivity, uh, specificity there. But if we want to maximise the sum of the sensitivity specificity, we want to get the most accurate, we want to classify as many cows as infected, not infected, or major and not major, then our cut points are actually a bit higher. And this is to deal with the, with the, the miners, basically. Uh, and so quite, quite high cut points. And I'm certainly not advocating those at all, but I just want to show you, show you what happens when you do that. What we could do, and probably should do, is do the economics. So what is the economic impact of a false negative. What happens if we miss a major pathogen infection and we put teat cell in, all right? Does she go clinical next lactation? Does she have lower cell count? Does she get culled? And whereas if we've got a specificity problem, so a false positive, we use more dry cow, what's the impact of that? And, and you can actually use economic modeling to say the optimal cut point is to maximize, you know, take your sensitivity to 95% and your specificity to 50%. That's economically the optimal place to be. We haven't done that modeling and it's kind of a, a job to do in a rainy afternoon. Um, what's that mean in cow numbers? So we've been talking sensitivity specificity. So you've got a 500 cow herd, you're about to dry it off. Um, what does using the all flex at a cut point of 150, um, which is what Rob ended up using uh, as his cut point, what does that really mean in a, in a 500 cow herd? And this is the actual data from the study. I've just made it to 500 cows rather than 700 cows, just to make the numbers easier. So in those 500 cows, we truly had 67% of cows, 67, sorry, cows that had a major pathogen. At the 150 cut point, the Allflex would have said, yep, 60 of those were over the 150, seven were below. So these are your false negatives. So these are major pathogen infected cows that we probably would like to treat. The miners, uh, you, know, you can see they're, they're, they're split between over 150, less than 150, as, as we'd expect. And then in the no growth, 51 of the no growths turned up with a cell count of over 150 out of the 175. So about a third of the no growths turned up over that threshold. And arguably these are, you know, there's no bugs there. We don't need to put dry cow in there, but because we're gonna use 150, we will. We'll put, we're overusing dry cow. Yeah, by 50 odd cows, a couple of hundred tubes in, in this particular case. They're the real numbers, right? And, and I could shift this cut point to 200 or 125, and you'd see, you know, the numbers would shift a little bit, but we're always going to have false negatives and false positives. Doesn't matter where we put that cut point. Um, the next question is if, if I take an all flex cut point of 150, and then I take, for example, the last herd test of over 150, what's the agreement between those two tests, right? Now, remembering that the Allflex is the average of that 12 weeks. We've got 18 data points on average, whereas the last herd test is just one data point. So how well does it agree if I just you know, slice and dice the cows based on the Allflex data or the, the herd test data? And there are the numbers over the, the entire population of 774 of the test cows. You know, we've got 327 cows that were over 150 on the Allflex and the herd test, 252 that were below. But we've got some discrepancies pretty clearly there. And you go, oh, that doesn't look that flash. The agreement's 75%, so 75% of the cows agree. But there's some disagreements. And I looked at that and went, oh, that's not so good. Um, but when I started thinking about it, a lot of this is due to the minor pathogens, you know, dropping above and below the threshold. So let's just look at the majors now. So this is of the 104 cows, in this subset of cows that were truly infected with a major pathogen, all flex and the last herd test agreed on 90, uh, have, having high cell count. There were six that were low on both, and there were three and five that dis disagreed across the axis. But our agreement's now 92%. They're actually agreeing pretty well. Um, but as I say, we're comparing apples with oranges, and this, this really doesn't surprise me. But what it does mean is if you use the all flex data, you're going to get a slightly different set of cows than if you'd use your herd test data. It, it's going to happen, and, and that's not surprising. Cool. Now, the other question we were asking was, does bale coverage matter? So effectively, what this is asking is, if we're only getting 10% bale coverage, 
then obviously we've got less data than if we've got 25% bail coverage. So if we drop data points out, you might say, oh, the test is going to be less accurate. The area under the curve is going to get less because it's less predictive. But in fact, the area under the curve is not statistically different. It doesn't matter if we've only got 10% bail coverage up to 50% bail coverage. Um, and so, you know, really what that's saying is if you take that 12-week window, um, there were, I think from memory, uh, seven... Yeah, well, there we are. The median was if, if we had 10% bail coverage, we had seven data points from each cow on average. Some had one, some had whatever. Um, and, and as we increase the bail coverage, of course, you get more data points. But getting more data points doesn't actually help the model. It's no more predictive. So what that's saying is, you know, at the standard commercial 25% uh, bail, we're fine. You know, it's, it's giving us as good as we're going to get. We don't need to put more uh, of these devices in, at least for this, this application. Cool. So just pulling that all together, um, I think what this data has shown us is that using that 12-week mean uh, all-flex somatic cell count data algorithm, it's, it's, it's equivalent. Uh, it's certainly not different from using her test data. So we can be pretty confident that we can use that data in place of or as well as, as her test data. It, it's doing a great job. The bail coverage, as I've just shown you, makes relatively little difference. So if you've got a farm that's only got 25% bail coverage, don't worry about it. You're actually going to get reasonable numbers out of it. You don't have to tell the farmer to put 50% bail coverage in or, or whatever. Um, and just to finish up, I'd uh, just like to acknowledge the herd owners and staff who, who kind of collaborated with us. The tech teams from Cognosco, Coastal Vet and Vet South, uh, my micro team did a lot of work and the MSD team who paid the bills and did some of the smart maths for us as well. So with that, um, I'll leave you with um, milking in India. So this is a little village I wandered to when I was over there the other week. This guy's hand milking um, and the, the local villagers were turning up on push bikes with little, you know, one litre pails and, and buying milk straight out, of, straight out of the cow, nice and warm. There you go.